It's good to see you guys here this morning. I encourage you to come back tonight. Pastor Austin has a great message um, in our series, The End of the World. Um, it is good to see our team that went down to Texas to do some relief work down there uh, that you're back. Um, thank you for going and spending several days down there working and um, serving that church down there. I know it was a huge blessing um, to them. And sometimes when you go on trips like that, you come back feeling more blessed than what you gave out. And so I, I pray that that is taking place for you. So uh, my name is Pastor Brian, and we're continuing our series today, um, Jesus Is. And in just a moment, we'll get to reading the Bible. So if you have your Bibles, and hopefully you do, turn to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. We'll get there in just a moment. But uh, let's have a confession time. How many of you have ever walked into a door thinking it was open? Yeah, let's look around. Keep your hands up because you're not alone, all right? This is, this is a family here. We can be honest. Um, one, one time, I don't remember how long ago it was, not too long ago, I got up in the middle of the night for something, and um, my door is usually always open, you know, in, in my bedroom. And for some reason, that night, it was like halfway open. <laughs> and so... Just the edge of the door, I just smacked right into that thing. And boy, not only did I have a sore face, but my heart was just racing like, what just happened to me? So uh, how many of you, moment of confession, how many of you have ever uh, walked through a screen door? Like maybe you've knocked that thing all the way through, yeah? Uh, my, once a few years ago, my family and I went on vacation, and um, we hadn't been to the place that we had rented for just like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and my, my daughter just ran through the screen door, knocked it over, and I'm thinking, this is getting expensive already, so. <laughs> but uh, today we're talking about um, Jesus being the door. So if you're taking notes, you can write down Jesus is the door. Like I said, we're continuing the series Jesus is, and it's been great uh, to hear of the I am statements that Jesus makes in the Gospels. And next week, um, Pastor Jeff is going to continue this when he's talking about Jesus being the shepherd. And so uh, today we're going to focus on verses 1 through 10 of John chapter 10. So in order to have an understanding of what's taking place in John chapter 10, we kind of need to back up a little bit and, and uh, look at the bigger picture of what's taking place. Um, so Jesus, he's condemning the Pharisees in John chapter 10. Um, Basically, what has happened is Jesus has healed a blind man on the Sabbath. On their holy day, Jesus healed him. This is the blind man that Jesus spit into dirt, you know, made saliva mud, put it on the guy's eyes and said, go wash in the pool. And um, this is, that's that story that's just taken place. And so this blind man basically has been excommunicated. He's been kicked out of whatever thing that they're a part of and, and, so Jesus has kind of come in, and he's talking to the Pharisees and, um, and, and talking to them and condemning them. So um, Jesus, in chapter 10, is continuing the conversation. So don't think that chapter 10 begins like this new place where they're at, this new um, conversation, you know, three days later type of thing. This is just kind of going in from 9 into 10. And so Jesus is just talked about being spiritually blind to the Pharisees, and he's changing his imagery to sheep and shepherds. And back then, this was, this was kind of a big deal because um, being a shepherd and having sheep back then was, was big. Uh, it was very prominent back then, and so he's relating uh, some things to the Pharisees so they can maybe understand. Uh, back then, in the Jewish mind, the word shepherd was any kind of leader. The word shepherd was any kind of leader. So a spiritual leader, a political leader, uh, they looked to the king and to the prophets as shepherds. And so uh, Jesus is kind of saying, talking to them um, with that context in mind. So with all that being said, let's read John chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Je this is Jesus speaking. I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Verse 6, Jesus used this figure of speech. Uh, but they didn't understand what he was telling them. How many of you parents can relate to that? Like, listen, son, I'm talking to you, but you still have no clue what I'm trying to say, right? <laughs> okay. Probably what Jesus was feeling like a little bit. Verse 7, he goes on. So because they don't understand, he begins to, like, 
explain it more. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you uh, for being so amazing. We thank you for the written word of God, and I pray that today would be a day that um, you, you continue to work in our hearts, Lord. We thank you that there's power in your word, and I pray that we would take it to heart, Lord Jesus. In your powerful name we pray, and everyone said, amen. So, Jesus opens up in verses 1 through 6, he opens up this familiar illustration uh, that a lot of people would understand. Um, so the, the sheep fold or the sheep pen back then was kind of like this enclosed um, rock wall, basically with one entrance into it. Um, and so large enough that the sheep couldn't jump over, but not like this massive tall wall that's 40 feet tall type of thing. So um, in just a moment, I'll show you a picture of what maybe one would look like. But um, so there's one way in and one way out, and, and the shepherd was literally the door. So the shepherd would lay across the opening at night, would guard the opening, guard, be the door, the gate. And so the sheep could not escape without the shepherd knowing. Um, no thief, no robber, no animals could enter because the shepherd was guarding, the, the shepherd was the door. And so that's kind of where Jesus is coming from when he would say, listen, thieves have to jump over the wall and steal and do all that kind of stuff. So, um, and another thing, there, it was unusual to have several different flocks of sheep in the sheep pen. And so in the morning, uh, the shepherds would gather together and they would call their sheep. And so um, there's a gentleman by the name of H.V. Morton. He tells of a scene that he saw in a cave near Bethlehem. Two shepherds had put their flocks in the cave during the night and in the morning um, they, they were sorting them out. So one of the shepherds stood some distance away, gave out his very unique call, which only his own sheep knew. And soon the whole flock had run to him because they knew his voice. And they would not have come for anyone else, but they knew the call of their own. And so Jesus is saying, listen, the true shepherd is the one who comes in the right way. Um, the, the, the sheep recognize him. Um, thieves and robbers could not enter through the door, so they had to climb over the wall. They had to deceive. Um, but even if the, sh the, the thief got in, um, the, the sheep would not follow because they didn't recognize his voice. And th so that's kind of where Jesus is coming from in verse 10 when he said they have to steal, kill, and destroy um, for all of that. So like, like it says, Jesus is trying to explain this. And it says they still don't understand. So he begins to like unwrap this a little bit more. And remember, let's go back. This occasion, why he's telling them this is because the blind man has been healed. The blind man has been set free, and the Pharisees don't like that. And they're recognizing the more power that Jesus has. So Jesus is saying to these Pharisees, listen, you are false shepherds. You are self-appointing, you know, putting yourself in the spiritual leader role of these Jewish people, and it's, you're not. Um, and so Jesus came to be the shepherd. Um, they kicked out this blind man. Jesus came and welcomed in, him in. And so Jesus is speaking. They don't understand. So he digs a little bit deeper. And starting in verse 7, that's, this is where we're going to spend some time, um, is this. I want to read this again. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All whoever came before me, they're thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. Uh, this is a picture of what the sheep pen um, possibly could have looked like. So this gives you a better understanding of when it says, I'm the door, uh, the shepherd literally was the one, you know, guarding that, laying across it at night, whatever it needed to take place. So um, in the first service, I made, uh, um, I, I got my game shows mixed up, and I thought it was the prices right, but it's this game show, Let's Make a Deal. How many of you have ever seen that TV show, Let's Make a Deal, right? Um, is it still on, by the way? Just reruns? It is still on. Okay. Um, and they usually would have three doors, right? So there's three doors there. And in the first service, mind you, I'm talking about the prices, right? In my mind, I know it's let's make a deal, but I said that's the prices, right? And there's like so much confusion in the people, and I had no idea why. So it's let's make a deal. Um, 
One, one gentleman said, yeah, some lady behind me was like, that's not the price of rights. It's let's make a deal. So sorry, I messed it up. So usually on that show, there's three doors, right? You can choose door one, door two, and door three. And as a young kid growing up, you know, I probably usually chose door three, thinking that's the magic door. And it was like a vacuum, you know, or like a coffee pot. And then the next person got a brand new car or a trip to Hawaii or whatever it may be. But um, just as the shepherd was the literal door for the sheep pen, Jesus, here's what Jesus is saying. He makes this very exclusive claim. He says, I'm the door. It's very exclusive. There's, there's not options here. It's me and only me. Through Jesus and Jesus alone do we find access to God. Look at Ephesians 2.18. It says, for through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. So Jesus came to show us what God is like, to open up the way to God, and he made it possible for us to have access to God. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So there's this exclusiveness about Jesus being the door. In our world, it's not very politically correct to think this way, is it? To say that there's one door, there's one way to God, there's one way to eternal life. And so Jesus is not suggesting there's several doors. He's not suggesting there's several options here like on let's make a deal. He's saying there's one, there's one way, there's one door and it's me. Our religious duties are the works that we conjure up, the baptisms, giving in our offerings, serving here at church, whatever it may be, that is not what saves us. It's Jesus, isn't it? It's Jesus and Jesus alone. Just like there was one door, one gate into that sheep pen, um, there's one door with access to God, and that is Jesus, and I'm so thankful for that. Verse 8, Jesus says, all who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. So Jesus is referring to this. Uh, all of the false uh, prophets, the people who appointed themselves to be spiritual leaders uh, but were misleading people. Jesus is not referring to the true prophets of the Bible. Um, they pointed to him. They pointed to God. So Jesus isn't referring to them. He's referring to the false messiahs, these false prophets that misled the people. Uh, my neighbor has a fenced-in backyard, and they have one way to get in there. And the reason I know this is because we've had several Frisbees and footballs gone into their yard. And it's a tall fence, and so uh, we've done several knocks on the door like, hey, uh, so can you go once again to get my football? Thank you. Um, so they have this fenced-in yard, and they have one way in there. If one day I looked out and I see someone tearing apart that fence, or I see someone climbing over the fence, that's not my child, um, I'm assuming that that person does not have permission to be there, wouldn't you? Um, th they don't have the right of way to be in there because they're going about it the wrong way. And in the same way, Jesus is saying the man that doesn't use the door but has to climb over the fence has no right to be there. See, these were not true shepherds, uh, nor did they have the approval of God on their ministry. Th these people did not love the sheep. They did not love the people. They exploited them. They abused them. This beggar is a perfect example of what took place. It's clear in the gospel record, the religious rulers of Israel were only interested in themselves and protecting themselves. So this is a very exclusive claim by Jesus, and I want you to know this, listen closely, it still is true today. This truth is still today. It hasn't changed over time. It hasn't changed because of culture or because we're now across the ocean in a different land. It's still true today. We can try in our own effort, we can try our own hard work, but the truth is without Jesus, we have no access to God, without Jesus. Acts 4.12 says this, salvation is found in nobody else for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And that kind of goes into our next thought. Jesus makes an incredible offer. In verse 9, read that once again. Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Will be saved. How many of you have ever had an offer too good to pass up? Too good to pass up. Like, all right, I've met this store and... and 
you know, whatever it may be. I was talking to someone today, and they found a, a sweet pair of shoes at Goodwill for like five bucks. I'm like, that is like too good to pass up, an incredible offer. Um, one time, I haven't had many of these, but one time I got a speeding ticket, all right? I've confessed, don't worry. I've, I'm okay with Jesus. Um, so the hard part, what made it worse, was that my dad was in the car with me. <laughs> That's what made it hard. Um, I was out of high school, I was out of college, and so, you know, he kind of just let life be the teacher in that moment. But, um, so I got a speeding ticket, and how great would it have been if the police officer, as he hands me the ticket, he hands me money to pay off the ticket, right? That would be amazing. Or I go to the judge, and the judge just pays it for me or wipes it clean. That would be amazing. It didn't happen, unfortunately, but that would be a great offer. And here, Jesus is making this wonderful offer. He says... Um, I love this part. He says, whoever enters through me will be saved. This word saved means delivered, safe, and sound. Delivered, safe, and sound. It was used to say that a person had recovered from a severe illness. This person had come through a bad storm. They had survived a war or they were acquitted in courts. Unfortunately, sometimes preachers want to take away this word saved. But you know what? Jesus used it. It's right here in the Bible. He came to save us. So as the door, Jesus delivers us from bondage. I love this. He delivers us from bondage and leads us into freedom. Ultimately, Jesus, in verse 10, he's referring to the ultimate thief of Satan himself. And Jesus came not only to save us, but to save us from a life of eternity separated from God so that we can have eternal life. We can spend the rest of our lives worshiping and in heaven with with Jesus and, and worshiping God. Jesus says, Satan, he's come to steal, to kill, and to destroy When you read it now in the context of of what Jesus is saying, you understand, listen, the the false shepherds back then, they wanted to steal the sheep. They wanted to just manipulate and abuse and exploit. And and, uh, just like Satan, he wants to steal. He wants to kill. He wants to destroy our lives. And Jesus says, listen, I've come to give life. So if you picture a wall that has been created by our sin, a massive wall, and it separates us from God, and there's no way over the wall. Our only hope is to go through the wall, through a door. As Herschel Ford says, a door is in direct contrast to a wall. It's hard to climb over a wall. It's easy to go through a door. Anyone who wants to get to God does not have to climb. They just take a step. He says a preacher preached a sermon on the text from John 6, 37. It says, he that comes to me, I will not cast out. And after the service, this young woman comes to him and she says, is that all that I have to do is just come to God through Christ? Just come as I am just this instant right now? And the preacher said, yes. So this young woman, she falls on her knees and she says, Lord, I I do come. I accept you and your promise to take me. The joy of salvation flooded her heart and her soul. Later on, she says this, for years I'd been stumbling because I didn't know how simple it was. I didn't know that you just had to come to God through Jesus. Listen, it's so simple. We don't have to complicate this. It's through Jesus and Jesus alone. But I want you to notice something. This door is only helpful when it's used. Look at what Jesus says. He said, if anyone enters, Jesus doesn't force you. He doesn't force us. He wants our heart, and he wants uh, us to choose him. The door is, is always open to anybody who's willing to turn their back on sin and to, um, to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. So as we admit our sin, we believe in our heart that Jesus is God's son. We confess that Jesus is Lord. Man, that door is open, and we walk into a wonderful relationship with Jesus. So not only does Jesus make this exclusive claim, I'm the door, and then he gives us this incredible offer the, the final truth through these verses is this, that he has amazing benefits. He has amazing benefits. I want to read verses 9 and 10 once again. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and life to the fullest. When a young couple gets married, they have the wedding, the wedding day, and there's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of celebration with it. Yesterday, Travis and Michelle Brock were married. We've had several people getting married recently in the last few weeks. 
Uh, but the wedding day is not the last day. It's actually just the beginning. And when I, I visit with couples as they're preparing to get married, I, I try to encourage them to think beyond just the wedding day. Like there's so much prep into the day of the wedding, but sometimes not a lot of prep for the marriage itself. And so um, if, if the wedding day was the final day, then there wouldn't be a lot of people signing up to get married, right? Um, because that would be kind of sad and disappointing. But it's the days that follow that are bright, they're rich, they're full of promise. As, they, as this couple, they live together, they grow to know each other more and love each other deeper uh, that make that wedding day so important. And just as it is with salvation, when we get saved, it's just the beginning. Like we have now an opportunity to get to know God even more. Like to grow more intimately with him, to know him on a deeper level, to worship him on a deeper level. And this is what it means to be saved. So here's some benefits coming out of these verses that I want you to see. And you can write them down if you're taking notes. A couple of the benefits that come from Jesus are so amazing. The first one is this, is peace. Peace. So look at verse, the end of uh, verse 9. He says, he will come in and go out. He will come in and go out. Jesus is describing to these false shepherds um, a way of life that is absolutely safe and secure. A, a life so secure. When back then, they, when they heard this, this is what it meant. When a man can go in and go out without fear, it means that his country is at peace. And that he enjoys perfect security. Listen, when we discover Jesus as the door, there is a peace, isn't there? There's a peace that the Bible says goes beyond our understanding. It guards our heart and our mind. There's this new sense of security that enters our heart, and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Another benefit that comes from Jesus is their satisfaction. The last part of verse 9 says, and find pasture. You know that saying that the grass is always greener on the other side. Heard that, probably said that before or thought that before. When we belong to Jesus, we are on the greener side, right? We are on the greener side. We are finding the pasture that satisfies us. And we don't have to go looking anywhere else. There's no, no person, no in, institution that will satisfy um, like Jesus will. A few verses that I want to read for you. Psalm 103 verse 5. Who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Psalm 107 verse 9 says, For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Philippians 4.19, My God will supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Listen, this does not mean that we'll get everything that we want, but it does mean that we'll have the sense of satisfaction in our hearts. We have that peace in our heart like never before. And the, the final benefit from Jesus is this, in verse 10, a full life. It's this full life. This word more abundantly, that phrase in the Greek means to have a super abundance of a thing. A super abundance of a thing. More than you could ask for. More than you could possibly use. It's kind of like going to Sam's Club or Costco. Anybody like me, when you walk in, you're like, your eyes get big like, oh boy, there's so much here I could get. There's so much I could use. You, you walk out thinking, I got the steel of a century. I didn't buy just like a jar of mayonnaise. I bought the gallon of mayonnaise. <laughs> right? Uh, I didn't get just a 12-pack of toilet paper. I got the whole pallet. Like, I don't know what I'll use it for, but I got a deal, right? I got a super abundance of a thing. When, when we enter into a life with Jesus, he says, I've come to give life and life more abundantly. This super abundance of life, more than we could even, like, Describe in our own words. We have super abundance of life. And there's no way that life without Christ is better than a life with Christ. There's no way because Jesus has come to give life. So my question to us today is this. Are we alive but without life? And we're here today. We're breathing. But do we have life inside of us, a life from Jesus? Because Jesus says, I've come to give life and I've come to enrich life. The worship team, if you would come at this time. Listen, Jesus is the door. Jesus is the way to God. 
And the wonderful thing is this, is that through Jesus, we have a satisfied, peaceful, and full life. Because he's the door. He is the only way to God. The absolute and only way to God. And I want to remind us that we do not earn our salvation by good works. We do not earn our salvation because we're sitting here in church today. We do not earn our salvation because we give in the offering. Those things are good. Don't get me wrong. But listen, it's through Jesus and Jesus alone. So let's don't complicate things in our life. Let's just humbly come to Jesus and say, Jesus, be the door. I enter through you. I, I, I enter into a life of peace and security. Would you bow your heads this morning with me? There's one way, it's Jesus. Today, if you need to repent of your sins, come to Jesus. I encourage you to do so. With heads bowed, this morning, if you are ready to step through the door, and you're ready to have life to the fullest through Jesus, not on your own efforts, but life to the fullest through Jesus, today, would you respond by simply raising your hand and saying, Jesus, that's me. Jesus, that's me. Thank you, young man, for being honest. Thank you for being honest. Anybody else? I'm ready to step through the door. Thank you for being honest. And to live a life through Jesus, a full life, a satisfied life. Thank you. Anyone else? Salvation is here, and it's Jesus and Jesus alone. Jesus you pray with me if you responded by your hand being raised from your heart or even verbally you can repeat after me but whether you responded or not let's join in prayer Jesus I admit that I'm a sinner Jesus I've tried life on my own I've tried life without you and I've failed today Jesus I surrender my heart have your way I believe in you help me to live for you every day thank you that you are the only way to heaven thank you that you are the door Jesus and today I surrender my life to you